Welcome back to another episode of Haunted and Historic Australia's Criminals, Cutthroats and Convicts. In this episode, we learn about the bloody butcher of Sussex Street. Now, this is in a time around the 1860s where Sussex Street in the city of Sydney is more like a slum unlike how nice it is today, where it's all mainly businesses and high-rise buildings. Back in 1860, it was basically where the cheapest and possibly even man-made houses were built back in the day where people didn't have a lot of money. It was literally the start of the slum life in Sydney. And it wasn't just one family in these houses either. There was a lot of kids and often an uncle or a grandmother or a grandfather, an auntie or even close friends would all be cramped in a small dwelling. You wouldn't even call them a house really. A lot of them were put up with whatever materials were laying about in the street and they didn't have any real sewerage control either. There wasn't any toilets inside these premises and if there was, it was probably in a corner somewhere in the back room. And a lot of the ones that didn't have toilets would basically use containers of some kind to have their business and then toss it in the front yard or into the street. So it was quite a disgusting place. And this wasn't just people's homes either. There was the Sir Walter Scott Hotel and this particular pub didn't have the best public toilets either. And often whatever was or however people went to the toilet in this place the actual product of that was thrown out the back into a vacant lot. So it was quite a grimy place, old Sydney town, in the 1860s. People didn't have work. People were... A lot of these houses were piled on top of each other and they often were stinky or smelly. On this particular occasion, Sussex Street was the scene of a ghastly murder. Imagine yourself as an 11-year-old child walking along your street and your dog's following you. It's a picture that most of us have had as a child of having your dog walk along next to you in your own street or exploring the street, going out, playing with other kids in the street. But imagine that your dog comes along and starts scratching at a rubbish heap on an abandoned lot. Dogs are renowned for sniffing out things. If it's a piece of food or heaven knows what, they'll be into it. On this occasion, a young boy in 1860 was doing just this, walking along Sussex Street, having a little look around his neighbourhood with his dog Carlo. Jamie Kilpatrick is his name. And Carlo finds something interesting on a vacant lot and starts scratching around some rubbish that's been left there. And out rolls a ball, or at least it's what Jamie thinks it is. It's a bit sticky and it's got stuff stuck to it. He can't really notice what it is, but it looks round, so he kicks it. The ball rolls along the street until it rolls onto one side and poor Jamie sees a face looking back at him. It was a head. It was somebody's head. Jamie quickly ran to his house on Druitt Street around that corner so fast to get his dad. His dad came running out. What was the matter? And Jamie had to tell him what he'd seen. Jamie was instructed to go and stand near the head while the father ran to the police station not too far from there. Now the police didn't waste any time getting there. They combed the area and upon doing this, especially around the back of the Sir Walter Scott Inn, where it was a vacant lot. There was quite a lot of rubbish to go through, but the police managed to find bits of body parts belonging to the same person as the head. They worked out pretty quickly that it was a female body and a female's head. This story went out into the news and the people of the town pretty quickly. Everybody heard about it. The body found on Sussex Street was a woman. Now two men came forward, young men in their early 20s. One man was at Edgar Walter Weeks, a young pastry cook, and he tells a story of one night he was coming home from work down George Street. It was between 10 and 11 o'clock when he was approached by a man. My boy, would you mind helping me to carry a box? Now, a pastry cook probably didn't get a lot of money, so Edgar, assuming he was going to get a tip for his help, gladly obliged. 
and they walked around Sussex Street to a two-storey terrace house. This man walked up to the front door and unlocked it. He went inside to the back of the house. There was a large iron box and it was very heavy. Now Edgar went inside after the man and helped him try and get the iron box out of the house. It was very heavy and Edgar smelled a rather nasty odour coming from the box. He was very unhappy about this odour as it reminded him of the smell of his recently departed father's corpse. The two men heaved the trunk out into the dark empty street and they continued to go where the man told them. They had to stop along the way as it was quite heavy until they'd gotten a certain way down the road and Edgar told the man, look, I'm so sorry, I can't carry this anymore. It's way too heavy for me. The man said, oh, okay then, can you just wait here for a moment with the box? And the man went inside the nearest pub, which at the time was Coachmaker's Arms Hotel. He went inside for a couple of moments and then came back out with another young man who had agreed to help him for a small amount of money. Now, the man that owned the iron box turned to Edgar and gave him three pence for his trouble of taking the box so far as he did and told him that this young man would now help him. The new young man was named David Fitzpatrick and he also found the box to be very heavy. The men struggled on down the road when the man that owned the box gave up. He said to David, this will have to do and paid David a shilling for his help. They got as far as Liverpool Street which was about 350 metres from where they started off near Hay Street. The man must have got at the last block by himself to the empty lot behind Sir Walter Scott Inn on Sussex Street. It is known that Edgar and David, the two young men that helped that man, came forward and both told their stories of what happened that night. The police were able to piece together where the man had come from and taken the body, but they didn't know who he was. But it wouldn't take them long before they had some clues. As for the body at this point, a Dr. Arthur Renshaw reconstructed the body of the female and had worked out that she died from a heavy blow to the skull. Along with the body, they actually found a scrap of the nightdress the lady was wearing when she was murdered. They also noticed that the body of the woman had been cut up or dissected, and that would have had to have been done by someone who knew how to cut up a body. And it didn't take them long to work out that it was most likely a butcher. The police wasted no time in contacting every butcher in the vicinity, as well as knocking on the door of the house that the iron box had been taken from. There they were greeted by a Mrs. Orr, and she had the property and let it out. And she was saying to the police how, yes, there was a man who leased the property out with his wife, Annie, and his name was Harry. She was sure that he'd mentioned that he'd been a butcher and that they'd gotten married in the October of 1864. But she says later on, he told her that Annie had left him and she thought that was most strange. The police were shown into the room that Harry and Annie had leased and they found some most peculiar items. There was a blood-stained axe, a butcher's steel, the bodice of a woman's dress and a couple of pieces of torn chemise or sh torn nightdress. It is likely that they were rags, but nevertheless, one of the torn pieces of rag matched that of what was found on the body. She was most helpful in providing the police with most of the information of their case. However, she mustn't have had a forwarding address, as the police still had to find where he was currently lodging. It didn't take them long, though, because they were able to ask around and found that there was a journeyman, or drifter, living in the area of Paddington, which was semi-rural at the time. A police constable, Hogan, knocked on the door of a dwelling in this region and asked for a William Henry Scott, who, it seems, was an alias that he was going by, or perhaps it was his real name and Harry was the alias. Either way, this man came to the door and they had their man, Harry or William Henry. Either way, this man was sent to Central Station by cab, where he was questioned by an Inspector Reed. Let's call the man William Henry. 
as that seems to be his official name. Now, he was quite surprised when he was told of charges that were laid against him being of murder of a woman. He said, but my wife lives in Victoria. I could not have killed my wife. She wasn't even in Sydney. It seems that they must have had the man on display for the two youths that had helped him move the box, Edgar and David, and both of them pointed him as the man that they helped move the box. So they had their man and they were sure of it now. Under the pressure, William Henry said that he had had a woman living with him at the place of Mrs. Orr, but that she'd left and that she was no longer around, that she wasn't his wife and that his wife, Emma, was in Melbourne. Then they'd been married since September the 12th of 1866 and he was desperate to get back to her. We're not certain how desperate he was, given that he married Emma in the March on a Friday and on the Monday he told her he had to go to Sydney for business and then he was gone for six months. Real desperate to get back to her, it seems. The police were very perplexed at this stage. What was going on? And where was the woman that was living with him at the time? Something was definitely amiss. The woman that was living with him at Mrs. Orr apartment must be the woman that he's murdered. Now, all this is quite strange. Young Jamie Fitzpatrick found the body on October the 21st, 1866. And time was getting on. It had now been several weeks since the body was found and they had to make a case against William Henry Scott. They went over their steps, interviewing Mrs Orr again, as well as the neighbours of Mrs Orr to see if they could find any information. They also interviewed people that William Henry Scott or Harry had worked with and it was amazing the amount of information people gladly gave. When they went back to Mrs Orr, they had a run through everything that she could remember about Annie. Not only did they do this, but they contacted a church that Mrs Orr had said that they'd casually spoken about being married in a year before. They got hold of the church sexton at St Paul's Church in Ipswich and he confirmed that they did get married and he also gave a description of Annie Scott that seemed to be very close to what Mrs Orr had said. And also, Mrs Orr remembers that Annie had had a chipped tooth and they were able to go back to the doctor who did the autopsy or pieced it together and they'd been able to find a cracked tooth in the head. The case was looking good. They also interviewed the neighbours of Mrs Orr who were a Thomas and Mary Trevelyan. They ended up saying that they could remember vaguely being awoken in the night by a heavy thump or at least Mary was, and she had said that it had sounded like someone had fallen in the house next door. The thickness of the walls between the terrace houses was not very private, and it was quite a noise she was easily able to hear, as well as the sound of a blow and that of someone being dragged, or at least that's what she thought in the middle of the night. But it wasn't enough to give her the urge to wake her husband next to her, and she said nothing until now. Now, lastly, they spoke to some of the butchers that William Henry Scott had worked with over the past couple of months while he'd been in Sydney, and they were very forthcoming with information. They actually had a laugh to themselves, a couple of them, and they said, oh yeah, we remember Annie, yeah, we used to call her the kangaroo. She was really tall, and sometimes she'd come around and pick up Harry at closing time. Thomas Rice, his former employer, said that originally when he started working for him, he was quite bright and alert, but then must have been around the time of Annie's disappearance that he became listless and inattentive to the extent that he had to fire him. One of his colleagues that was interviewed, a Bob Sylvester, said he remembers one day that Harry had come in and remarked to his fellow employees, I have made away with the kangaroo. Bob said that he understood that to meant that the couple had just separated, so he didn't think much of it, which actually corresponded to Mrs Orr as well as the church sexton. This was going to be enough to have him hanged for his wife's murder. Well, his first wife. It was time. William Henry Scott was tried before Justice Cheek, 
He had William B. Daly, who was his lawyer. It seemed like an open and shut case, but his lawyer Daly defended him well, saying that who could prove that the woman was killed in the room? Mrs. Trevelyan, next door, never said anything. Had she really even heard it? The blood-stained axe? Well, he's a butcher. And many other things he was able to knock down. Even the fact that when the police combed the room that they leased out with Mrs. Orr, there were no bloodstains or anything to suggest a murder had been committed in that room. They did find the iron box in the home of a, an upholsterer at Rushcutters Bay. They weren't able to find anything inside that either. It had been cleaned out. So really, could it be proven that the iron box held the remains of Mrs Annie Scott? It may be the body of Annie Scott that was in the vacant lot. How do we know that William Henry Scott had done it? The lawyer daily gave it his all, even pointing his fingers back at the youths who said they'd helped William with the box. As he was interrogating them, they seemed not as confident as they once were. Daly questioned that Edgar had changed his first statement that he'd given to police. Why'd he change it? And David, the other boy, had changed the day of the week that he thought he'd carried the box. If they could change their statements, could they even be sure of anything that they did that night? He was making a good case for William. He also said if William Henry Scott had killed his missus, why would he have put her in an iron box and, and had people shuffle her around the streets like a piece of furniture in the night? Would not it have been easier to dispose the remains separately by throwing them piece by piece into the harbour or burying them somewhere? It was giving the jury reasonable doubt. But the Solicitor General, Mr Isaac, toys defence to pieces. The jury lost little time in in finding William Henry Scott guilty. All through the trial and after, he insisted he was innocent. Neither was there that last moment confession that some murderers give to empty their black hearts of all they've done before they meet their maker. He still remained, even as he stood on the gallows and told the priest he had forgiven his accusers, but that he had never killed anyone in his life. No one will ever know whether he told the truth or not. Poor Annie. However she came to an end, it was a gruesome one. And he must have wanted to get rid of her to go and be with Emma in Melbourne. And poor Emma, married and waiting so long for someone who will never come back. It's quite a sad story for these girls, but I'm sure Emma made a life for herself when she found out eventually what had transpired. But for Annie, justice was served, as we can pretty much tell that even if he didn't do the deed himself, he probably would have paid one of his butcher friends to do it or something like that. So I think the right man in this case was hung for the deed. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Stay tuned for many more upcoming episodes. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share and comment on your favourite videos. And hit that notification bell so you're aware when we're posting more videos.